In the Vedic scriptures, the very first aphorism of Vedanta is Atato Brahma Jigyasa that you're going to spend your whole life in this world, you're going to be subjected to so many different experiences in this world, you're going to have to navigate all the twists and turns and ups and downs of this world. So the first thing you should do, Atato, the very first thing you should do is understand why does this world even exist? Thank you so much, Vineet, for your kind introduction and to the Hindu Life team for hosting us uh, this evening. It's always been one of my dreams to come to Princeton. I couldn't study here, um, but at least here I am with all of you this evening. Um, very happy to be here and, and share something with you this evening. So this evening, as you can see, we have a, a very beautiful topic. Um, which I hope will be relevant for you and which I hope will uh, stir some thoughts and ideas in your mind and hopefully will help you to kind of frame what you see in the world and the experiences, the emotions and the events of life. Uh, we live in a roller coaster world. There are so many ups and downs. There are so many twists and turns. I think when we all look back at our life, we had an idea of how we thought it would go. And then uh, many, many unexpected things happen along the journey. And the Bhagavad Gita is a really beautiful book because it helps us to understand um, how to respond to those situations and how to frame, uh, you know, this journey of life. So today we're speaking about perfectly imperfect, the Bhagavad Gita and beauty. Um, with your permission, what I'll do is just before we begin, as we have some uh, more people coming in. Yes, please come, you're welcome. <laughs> I'll just say some prayers of invocation, which we usually do at the beginning of any kind of spiritual discourse, which really helps us to open our hearts and minds to receiving this spiritual knowledge and uh, trying to digest it um, on a much deeper level than just the intellect. Om Ajnana Timirandhasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Chakshurun Militam Yena Tasmai Shri Gurve Namaha Mukham Karoti Vachalam Pangam Lam Khayate Girim Yat Kripa Tamaham Vande Shri Gurum Dinatarinam Paramananda Madhavam Shri Chaitanya Ishwaram Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhara Shri Vashadi Gaura Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama Rama Hare Hare Thank you. As I was mentioning, the world we live in is full of so much variety. And uh, as we were walking around the Princeton campus today, I was thinking, wow, it's such a beautiful campus, uh, such architecture, um, such history. And we do look around the world and we see so much beauty in the world. Here on the screen, you can see uh, the beauty of nature, a smiling, uh, a shining sun, um, flowers, the, uh, different species of life. And 
And also we see so much beauty in human interactions, the love exchanged between human beings, uh, the beautiful acts of kindness and selflessness that human beings can and often do show. I would like to begin today by asking all of you to just close your eyes and you can relax, try to just disconnect from uh, everything around you. And in your mind's eye, I'd like you to picture a beautiful person. And it may not just be their physical beauty, it may be something about their qualities or their character. I'd like you for a moment to just visualize a beautiful person in your life. See if you can see them. How does seeing them in your mind's eye make you feel? Just take a snapshot of that beautiful person and maybe just in your heart, just say a thank you to them for the beauty and the joy that they've brought to your life. I want you to keep your eyes closed and now I want you to think of a, a really beautiful place what place is really close to your heart? What place moves your emotions? What memories does that place bring up? For a moment, see if you can just transport yourself to that place and offer your gratitude for divinity arranging that place for you to spend uh, time in. And finally, I'd like you to keep your eyes closed for one last meditation. And I want you to, in your mind's eye, uh, visualize a beautiful moment in your life. A moment which really uh, touched you in a deep way. Uh, relish that moment, be in that moment. Um, be grateful for that moment. Thank you so much. Yes, you can open. It's not nice to see so many smiles on your faces. <laughs> This is a meditation you can always do sometimes uh, to uplift yourself. Uh, as monks, we were actually taught this meditation um, that oftentimes we, in our consciousness, we tend to allow negativity to rest there more than positivity, more than beauty, more than joy. And somehow or other, if we're able to bring all the beautiful things that have happened in our life and, and that we've experienced to the forefront, then it really changes our vision. But not just that, it actually opens us up to experiencing more beauty. And when we are hijacked by negativity, then somehow we seem to always see negativity around us. And so this is a meditation that you can uh, take home with you today. So yes, we do live in a very, very beautiful world. Uh, in many, many ways, there is perfection in so many things. But perhaps there is also another side of the world. There's another side of life. Uh, maybe we can say there's also a darker side of existence. And maybe we sometimes look around at the world and think maybe it's not so perfect. Maybe it's not such a nice place. Maybe if I would have designed it, I would have designed it differently. Um, just to give you a sense of uh, the other side of the world we're living in, here are some statistics. If you have food in your fridge, clothes on your back and a roof over your head, um, you're richer than 75% of people in the world. That's amazing. You know, 75% of people in the world uh, don't have uh, a permanent residence that they can call a home. Um, if you uh, have money, if any of you by, by chance have a bank account, 
then you are in the top 8% of the world's wealthy people. Interesting. Most people don't have that kind of security. Most people don't have that kind of resource to lean back on. If you've never experienced the danger of battle, the agony of imprisonment or torture, or the horrible pangs of starvation, you're luckier than 500 million people right now, right at this moment, um, on this particular day, 500 million people are experiencing this. And if you can read this message, which all of you definitely can, you're more fortunate than three billion people in the world who never had that opportunity to learn how to read or write because they were born and subjected to a place where they had no access to schooling. And that's incredible. The world we're living in has big issues. And we kind of look at the world and we think there is so much imperfection in the world we live in today. There's global conflict and war. Uh, there's economic imbalance and uncertainty, the divide between rich and poor. I, I can't tell you the exact statistic, but I don't think I'd be too much off if I said 90% of the people, 90% uh, of the wealth in the world is probably owned by about 2% of the people. That's the kind of uh, gaps that we see in the world today. There are huge problems on a health level, not just physical, mental health. Uh, the World Health Organization has confirmed that mental health is practically the most uh, exponentially rising issue in the world today. Problems with diet and disease, uh, cancer and so on so forth. We have problems on the environmental level and sustainability, which are well documented crime, violence, and ethical issues, relationships. Um, and all of us have experienced some of this to some extent. So while we live in a very beautiful world, a world in which we can say there is so much perfection, we also cannot deny that there are many, many problems, many, many issues, many, many imperfections in the world. So how does the ancient wisdom literatures, how do they help us to understand the world situation which surrounds us? And what wisdom can the ancient scriptures give us which help, can help us to kind of respond to this um, without being displaced in our consciousness? And how to respond to this so that we can actually make a positive uh, change and a positive contribution. I'm going to read a verse to you. This is a verse from the Ishopanishad. Many of you are familiar that the Hindu body of scriptures are known as the Vedas. And in the Vedic body of knowledge, there are uh, many, many books, perhaps uh, hundreds and thousands, perhaps going into the millions of verses of wisdom. And it's said that the first books in the Vedic corpus that begin to deal with spiritual uh, subject matter are the Upanishads. And uh, of the 108 Upanishads, the Sri Isha Upanishad is said to be the perhaps the, the foremost, the essence. The Sri Isha Upanishad literally means that knowledge which brings you closer to God. Um, and what I'm going to do today is just read for you the invocation from the Sri Isha Upanishad just to see how does it relate to this concept of the world being perfectly imperfect. So the Sanskrit, which is very, very beautiful, goes like this. Om Purnam Adapurnamidam Purnat Purnam Udachyate Purnasya Purnamadaya Purnameva Vashishyate now this is very, very this is an extremely interesting verse, and it's almost counterintuitive to what I've just spoken about, and that's what we'll be discussing today. The translation is this: the personality of Godhead is perfect and complete, and because He is com per completely perfect, all emanations from Him 
such as this phenomenal world, are perfectly equipped as complete wholes. Whatever is produced of the complete whole is also complete in itself. Because he is the complete whole, even though so many complete units emanate from him, he remains the complete balance. It's a very poetic translation. Uh, very, very beautiful, very, very deep, very, very profound. If we, we were to boil this verse down into its essence, what it's basically teaching us is that God is complete and perfect. But not just that, the emanations from God, which are in two categories. The first category are the living entities, the living beings, the souls. They are also complete and perfect. But very, very interestingly, what's being said in this verse is that the other category of emanation from the complete whole divinity is this phenomenal world that we're living in now. And according to the Sri Isha Anishad, this world is perfect and complete. Now, that requires some thought, that requires some explanation. Because when we look at the world today, we may say it doesn't look perfect and it doesn't look complete to me. In fact, if I was in charge, I'd like to change quite a few things because I think I can uh, make it a better place. Can we make the world a better place? Should we make the world a better place? Is the world already perfect? Uh, how do we kind of approach uh, this topic? And that's what I'll be discussing a little bit with you today. And I will leave some time for some questions and answers because I feel this subject does need some discussion between us. So is the world perfect and complete? Just to do a little survey here, look at the world and in your heart of hearts say, I believe the world is perfect and complete. How many would put their hands up? It depends. It depends. It depends how you define perfection, I guess. Yes. Okay. It's complete, but not perfect. How do you define complete? Yeah, okay, so we, we, okay, let's break it down a little bit more. Let, let's do that, okay. In what sense is the world perfect? And I'm going to look at the definitions of completeness and perfection in a bit. But first, the Vedic teachers encourage us to answer one question before we understand why the world is perfect um, in the way it functions. There's one question which we have to ask ourselves first. I'm going to see whether you know what that question is. What question do you think needs to be answered first before we answer is this world perfect? Oh yeah, the harmony. Oh yeah, who we are. Okay. And the harmony. Pardon me. Harmony. 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 Okay. There has to be a collective. There has to be harmony. Okay. What question do you think is really important to answer before we make any judgment on whether this world is perfect and complete or not? Uh, what do you define okay so that that could definitely be there how do you define the world how do you define the world okay you're getting closer <laughs> to what i want yes so what is our purpose in life? yes what is the purpose of the world mm -hmm. unless we understand the purpose of something how can we determine whether it's perfect or complete? Because something is perfect and complete in relation to what it's meant to exist for. And therefore, unless someone knows what the purpose of the world is, 
unless someone knows the purpose of why I'm here, unless someone knows the purpose behind the things that happen here, how can they then determine whether it's perfect or complete? And therefore, in the Vedic scriptures, the very first aphorism of Vedanta is Atato Brahma Jigyasa, that you're going to spend your whole life in this world, you're going to be subjected to so many different experiences in this world, you're going to have to navigate all the twists and turns and ups and downs of this world. So the first thing you should do, Atato, the very first thing you should do is understand why does this world even exist? Because if you don't answer that question first, everything else will have the potential to bewilder, baffle, and uh, potentially deflate, depress, and disenthuse you. And so first we must understand the purpose of this world. And that's really where the Bhagavad Gita, the Upanishads, the Bhagavad Gita, by the way, is also known, although it doesn't strictly come under the body of knowledge of the Upanishads, is also known as a Upanishad. Sometimes the Bhagavad Gita is referred to as the Gita Upanishad because the nature of its knowledge is very much to do with uh, existential reality and distinguishing reality from illusion. So the Bhagavad Gita very much opens with this point of Krishna teaching the world or teaching everyone what the purpose of this world is. Um, what is the purpose of this world? That is a good question to ask. Before I ask that question, I'll ask you another question. They recently, not recently, this was some years ago, did a survey to find out the top ways in which people in this world relax. Yeah. Can you guys give me some ideas of you, the top ways in which you think people relax in this world? You can just shout some things out. Listen to music, Listen to music. go on a vacation, spa. go to a spa, I'm sure there's a good one here. Okay, finding meaning and finding direction and living according to that, that helps you to relax. Wow, that's a very noble way to relax. Amazing, yeah. Meditation, yes. Taking a nap, yes. Not in this session, but <laughs> later you can do that. Yeah. Watch TV. Watch TV, right. Yeah, like the four, these are the four top ones. And I want you to just listen carefully and tell me whether you learn anything from this. They ask people, what do you do to relax? And the top four answers were number one, go on holiday. Number two, watch TV. Number three, take intoxication. And number four, uh, go to sleep. Very interesting. Go on holiday, watch a movie, take intoxication, go to sleep. What do you think each four of those activities all have in common? You're escaping the reality of the world in front of you. Exactly. Each one of those activities is an escape from our immediate reality. And that's incredibly interesting because the way people want to relax in this world is they almost want to escape their world. But the ironic thing is when you go on holiday, at some point you have to come back. If you watch a movie, even if it's a Bollywood movie, at some point it has to end. Uh, when you take intoxication, uh, you may forget your life, but there's always the morning after the night before. And when you go to sleep, it's great, but at some point, you have to wake up. So it's very interesting that people, their intuitive uh, kind of pushing within them is to try to find a space beyond their world in which they can find respite. 
And that's incredibly telling. The Christian writer C.S. Lewis once said something incredible. C.S. Lewis said, If I find in myself a desire which no experience of this world can fulfill, then I must conclude I was made for another world. It's very profound, actually. And so what the Bhagavad Gita says is that the purpose of this world is actually to get out of this world. The purpose of this world is actually to signpost us and usher us to another realm of existence. The purpose of this world is to help reveal certain realities of life to us so that we can enter into an eternal reality beyond the temporary transitory things that we experience uh, around us. And in that sense, the Bhagavad Gita says, and the Upanishads tell us, that the world is perfectly <coughs> imperfect. Because all the imperfection, all the struggle, all the difficulty, all the ups and downs and the twists and turns and the problems and the issues and the obstacles and the stress is all there for a reason. It's all there to uh, guide us to something higher. There's a beautiful Christian prayer where the person writes, I prayed for strength and you kept sending me obstacles to overcome. I prayed for wisdom and you kept sending me problems to solve. I prayed for love and you kept sending me people who needed help. And then the person says, God, you gave me everything I needed but nothing that I wanted. So that's very really profound, because sometimes the world serves us up a variety of experiences which we don't want, but which we may need in order to discover our truest essence and our truest potential. And so, this is a very, very beautiful picture. In the 15th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna basically gives an analogy of the material world. And Krishna gives the analogy of a banyan tree. In Sanskrit, the banyan tree is known as Ashvatha. Ashvatha literally means, the Sanskrit etymology is, that which will not be here tomorrow. So Krishna says there's an original form of the banyan tree, which is the spiritual world. But as soon as there is material desire, the river or the body of water of material desire, then that original form of the spiritual world becomes reflected. And that reflection is basically the material world that we're in at the moment. And so what Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita is that this material world is basically a reflection of the eternal reality. In other words, everything we find here is also existing in the eternal realm, but not in its perfect form. But the imperfection that we see here is ingeniously designed in order to reveal to us that this is not our true home. And so this is a very, very beautiful kind of um, depiction that is given. And Krishna goes, we won't have time today to go into the details, but Krishna beautifully explains how in the perverted reflection of that original tree, the roots are upwards, the, the branches go downwards, and we're hopping from one branch to another, and we're tasting fruit, some are sweet, some are bitter. And in this way, Krishna gives a whole uh, depiction of the material world that we're living in at the moment. And, um, and how it functions. Vedic teachers, sometimes when they talk about this world that we're living in, they use different analogies. One analogy given of this material world that we're living in now is that it's a prison. 
Another analogy that's often given to describe the world that we're living in now, or a metaphor, is that this world is like a hospital. And sometimes the analogy that's given for this material world is that it's a school. And each one of those are very, very interesting if you think about them on a continuum, like a prison, a hospital, and a school. Then uh, on this side of the continuum, there's great discipline and control. And on this side of the continuum, there's inspiration and, you know, freedom to explore. But the common thing between all of those analogies of the world is that um, they're transforming something within us. If the material world is a prison, then it means each one of us have some level of deviant mentality within us which needs to be corrected. If the material world is a hospital, then it means each one of us have a certain amount of unhealthy consciousness that needs to come back to its proper uh, state. And if the material world is compared to a school, then it means that there's a certain amount of ignorance within each one of us that needs to be uh, eradicated. And so all of these analogies of the material world help us to understand that the experiences, the events, the emotions that we go through are meant to trigger a transformation within us, which then opens up our consciousness to a, a, a higher reality. And so on the battlefield of Kurukshetra, I'm sure many of you are familiar with the Bhagavad Gita, the Bhagavad Gita, of course, was spoken over 5,000 years ago, and it's a conversation, as we know, between Krishna and Arjun, and it takes place on a battlefield. And just as the battle is about to start, Arjun uh, requests Krishna in a very beautiful verse, Senayor Ubayor Madhye Ratham Stapayame Chuta. Arjun looks at Krishna and he says, can you draw the chariot in between the two armies? Draw my chariot right to the middle of the battlefield so I can see everyone who has come here to engage in this trial of arms. And in this way, uh, the first chapter of the Bhagavad Gita is entitled Observing the Battlefield or Observing the Armies. And of course, uh, the battlefield setting of the Bhagavad Gita is revealing in and of itself. Because uh, here today we're talking about the imperfection of the world, the struggle, the strife, and the, uh, the harsh experiences that we go through in this world. And that's really what a battlefield is all about. And basically, the conversation between Krishna and Arjun ensues from there because Arjun sees all the difficulty around him and he becomes confused, he becomes weak, he becomes baffled, bewildered and he begins to ask Krishna questions about life and his meaning and the purpose and he begins to ask questions about the world and why the world is structured and in, in, in the way it is and why we have to experience so much obstacle and difficulty. And basically, what Krishna does in the Bhagavad Gita is he gives Arjun a unique type of darshan. Now, darshan is a very, very interesting word. Uh, for those of you from Hindu backgrounds, you will often have heard growing up from your parents, now let's go and take darshan. And taking darshan in Hindu life often means going to the temple and seeing the forms of Krishna or Ram or other deities. But darshan extends beyond the physical act of seeing. Each one of us have a darshan. And darshan doesn't just mean the physical act of seeing, but it means your worldview. Here I've written, darshan refers to the direct and intuitive vision of truth and the nature of reality. Darshan is the lens 
through which we comprehend environments, events, and experiences. So basically, the whole of the Bhagavad Gita is meant to uplift, empower, and ignite Arjun in having spiritual darshan or a spiritual worldview. And if you look at the dialogue of the Bhagavad Gita, what's basically happening is through the steps of the Bhagavad Gita, Arjun's darshan is being uplifted. In the beginning, Arjun is having a type of darshan which is very much on the physical and the mental level. Later on, by getting wisdom from Krishna, Arjun uplifts his vision further and he starts seeing everything through a philosophical lens. And then through that, Arjun ultimately gets a realization of reality and then awakens a spiritual darshan. So basically, through the 45-minute conversation of the Bhagavad Gita, what Krishna does to Arjun is he takes him from a very material way of looking at life to an incredibly spiritual way of looking at reality. And as soon as he does that, Arjun's experience, Arjun doesn't move one inch. He's exactly in, he's ex, he's in exactly the same position on the, of the battlefield after 45 minutes, but he sees something completely different because his darshan has been uh, elevated by Krishna. In the beginning, when Arjun comes to the battlefield, uh, he has a very physical vision. He just sees people, he sees soldiers, he sees family members, he just sees armies. And therefore his darshan at this point is just a very, very physical darshan. He's just seeing what, what the immediate thing in front of his eyes is. But then very, very quickly, Arjun begins to then see all of those things and he awakens emotions, uh, his material emotions within him. He says, I'm now unable to stand here any longer. I'm forgetting myself. My mind is reeling. I see only causes of misfortune or Krishna um, like this. So his vision uh, in the beginning uh, is very much through his mind and senses and therefore he becomes displaced in his consciousness. He's not able to deal with the imperfection that he sees around him. Then what happens is that he accepts Krishna as his guru. And it's very interesting in the dialogue of the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna is kind of reluctant to accept the role of being his guru because to be honest, Krishna and Arjun were practically friends their whole life. So Krishna is like, are you sure you want me to be your guru? Like, we're friends. And Arjun realizes Krishna is of great wisdom and he says, no, no, Krishna, you must take the position. Which is very interesting because a true spiritual teacher doesn't need to impose themselves on others. There's no sense of intimidation or insistence to listen to them but uh, people are naturally drawn to hear from them by their inspiration or example. So Krishna becomes Arjun's guru by Arjun's request. And then Krishna begins to furnish Arjun with the vision of eternity. This beautiful terminology, I love it in the Bhagavad Gita. It says, those with the vision of eternity can see that the imperishable soul is transcendental, eternal, and beyond the modes of nature. Despite contact with the material body, O Arjun, the soul neither does anything, nor is entangled. And so here, through wisdom, Arjun begins to uh, see the world differently. This is known as Shastra Chakshush in Sanskrit, which means the ability to see things through the eyes of scripture. Um, they say we don't see the world as it is, we see the world as we are. And so when one is furnished with a different lens through which to uh, look at the world, then they see very, very different things. And so now Krishna uh, 
elevates Arjun's darshan by giving him uh, a picture of reality which helps him to frame what's going on around him. And then right at the end in a beautiful verse in Sanskrit, Arjun says, Nashtamoha shmite labdha tat prasadat mayachuta stitosmi gatat sandeha karishye vachanam tava Krishna says, uh, my illusion is now gone. I've regained my memory. I'm now firm and free from doubt and am prepared to act according to your instructions. So now equipped with spiritual vision, Arjun basically looks at the armies and sees something completely different. Uh, in the beginning, his bow was slipping, but now he, acts, uh, he grabs hold of his bow and he's ready to engage in his duty. In the beginning, Arjun's mind was reeling, but now Arjun's mind is fixed and focused. In the beginning, Arjun lost his inspiration, his drive. He was kind of losing the hunger for life. And at the end of the conversation, Arjun is inspired, he's enthused, he's ready um, to kind of, yeah, just... Uh, do what he's meant to do as a warrior on the battlefield. And so we can see that he goes through this kind of amazing transformation. And so basically, the Bhagavad Gita is a book which gives us the opportunity to similarly elevate our vision. Most people are seeing the world through their senses and through their sentiments. And when we see the world through our senses and our sentiments, there's a high chance that we'll become uh, overwhelmed by the events, emotions, and experiences of life because we have nothing to frame all of that within. But by contacting spiritual wisdom, spiritual literature, spiritual insight, what happens is we begin to then see the world through scripture, which gives us a different uh, vantage point, different perspective, and then eventually we begin to see the world as a spiritual being, as a spirit soul. And then we, when we look around at things, um, we're able to see something uh, different. And so what is that knowledge that Krishna gives to Arjun which uh, elevates his vision in this way? I'll just show you very, very quickly. There are five topics which are basically contained within the Bhagavad Gita. And these five topics are almost like the blueprint of reality. The first thing that Krishna teaches Arjun is identity. That Arjun, he says, you are not just a material body. You're not just a material mind. But you're a metaphysical, a spiritual spark of consciousness and you exist, you always will exist, and you have a purpose beyond the immediate reality that you're situated in. Then Krishna goes on to talk about the world that we're living in, how it came into existence, how it functions, the different influences that are there, and the purpose that it exists for. The soul living in the world and its movements in the world uh, are overseen by the Supreme, um, who is uh, outside of the whole material realm, uh, but who is intimately still connected to the material realm in different ways. And uh, the relationship between the soul and the world, and how the soul moves in this world, and the laws which navigate our movements in this temporary realm, that is karma, which is the fourth act, fourth topic, which is described by Krishna. And the mechanism through which the Supreme controls this world is known as time or kal. And so uh, that energy, that power, that um, what we call in Sanskrit, shakti, potency of God as time is described in uh, detail. And the soul and the Supreme that connection the Bhagavad Gita describes through the process of yoga, which is not one of the five topics of the Bhagavad Gita, but which is the common thread through every chapter of the Gita, because yoga means the means by which the soul connects to the Supreme. Now, this model 
is incredibly powerful because any existential question which anyone has, for example, why do bad things happen to good people? Or, you know, uh, what is the purpose of death? Or, you know, why does love never seem to last? Uh, why is it that when I achieve the things that I want to achieve, I still feel a vacuum within my heart? Any existential question which anyone wants the answer to can be found according to the hypothesis of the Bhagavad Gita if one comprehends these five topics and understands the process of yoga. And therefore, through the Bhagavad Gita and this almost this blueprint of reality, we're being uh, given the opportunity to understand the entirety of reality around us. And so, is the world perfect? Is the world imperfect? Uh, the Bhagavad Gita would say the world is perfectly imperfect. Because all the things that we experience here uh, have a deeper meaning in the journey that we're on. And uh, how do we find beauty everywhere? Yes, we find beauty, Krishna says, in the nature. Uh, Krishna actually says in a beautiful verse in the Gita, uh, I'll tell you the Sanskrit, but it's very beautiful. Krishna says, Yad yad vibhuti mat sattvam shrimad ur jitamevava Tattadeva vakachatvam mamate jom sasam bhavam Krishna says, whatever beautiful, glorious creations you see in the world uh, spring from but a spark of my splendor. And so uh, we see beauty in the world through all the beautiful things that are there and behind that beauty we see divinity. But we also see beauty in the world through all the challenges, all the difficulties. Because we see that behind all of that, behind all of the struggle, behind all of the imperfection is a beautiful purpose, <clears throat> is a beautiful opportunity. Because through um, behind all of those things, if we're able to digest it in the right way, which requires the right vision, then all of the imperfection of the world can actually open us up to uh, a much more beautiful reality. And in that way, uh, the Bhagavad Gita teaches us that the world is perfectly imperfect and that we can find beauty everywhere provided we've uh, developed the spiritual vision to see and understand uh, what is the deeper purpose uh, behind this existence. Thank you very much for your attention. I uh, really appreciate your time and your tolerance. And uh, yes, thank you very much. I have a question. It's, uh, um, it's about Arjuna and uh, Lord Krishna, where uh, Arjuna is being guided by Lord Krishna about uh, his state of mind. And like he said, when he came, he was in a physical condition and he was apprehensive about what he wants to do and as a friend, and then he made him as a guru. But also in our real life circumstances, we see that we also uh, get into our uh, you know, you know, questions and we are in a hesitation station. We ask colleagues, we are friends, we ask our, you know, any, any someone we trust, we do ask them. And we do get affected by it at that point in time. We have a realization, yeah, this is perfect. This is how I want to change my life. It has an effect for a certain amount of time in our lives. How about Arjuna? Did he, after this conversation, was able to kind of, you know, change his, uh, you know, he was totally a changed person. Uh, you know, how does that relate to the, or did he have actually the next day? Because it's only, it's only forty-five minutes discussion that he had. Yeah. Yeah. So. Uh, Thank you so much. Yeah. So after forty-five minutes, was it enough to just turn him? turn the corner for life and never look back and never have any moment of confusion again. Um, I guess uh, we see later on Arjun after the battle of Kurukshetra, he also gets, feels some level of dissatisfaction. He has moments in which he doubts. There's a very, very beautiful verse after the um, battlefield of Kurukshetra 
where he says, Desha kalartha yuktani rittapo pashamani cha haranti smaradas chittam govinda bihitani me. So after the whole battle has concluded and so many people have died, um, then naturally, there's even though he's the winner, he's the victor, there's naturally a feeling of uh, uh, guilt, yeah. And then he says in this beautiful verse, he says, uh, Govinda bihitani me, he says, now I'm remembering those words that Krishna spoke to me. Desha kalartha yuktani, he says, those words that I heard at the commencement of the battle, they stand true in all times, places, and circumstances. Rittapo pashamani cha, he says, when I hear those words and I remember those words, then again, rittapo means it satisfies the, uh, the, the heart which sometimes is bewildered. And so we can see that Arjun represents, we all have an inner Arjun. And Arjun very much represents us. And, and even after we gain spiritual wisdom, spiritual insight, there will still be moments of doubt. There will be moments in which we, uh, yeah, kind of uh, question ourselves. But what Arjun does is he goes back to that wisdom and he keeps remembering that wisdom and reapplying that wisdom and realigning himself with that wisdom. And by doing that, he again finds himself again on the path again. So I think that's the point. Like I was just, I often give the analogy that when a plane goes from one destination to another, say we were flying from London Heathrow to JFK, so when the plane takes off, the pilot has a flight path. But the very, very interesting uh, fact that you'll learn today is that a plane, when it goes from one, path, uh, one airport to another, it's only ever on the flight path for about 30% of the journey. For 70% of the journey, the plane is actually off the flight path because of wind, because of other f factors. It's always kind of on this side or on this side. But the amazing thing is that even though the plane is off the flight path for 70% of the journey, at the, after eight hours, it still reaches its destination. And what's the reason? Because the pilot is always trying to get back to the flight path. And it's almost like our human journey is like that. It's not like, oh, Arjun heard the Bhagavad Gita and then he was just on the flight path for the rest of his life. No, he had moments of challenge, moments of difficulty, and he kind of veered off. But then, Govinda, Bihitani, he remembered that wisdom and that wisdom brought him back. And then he veered off and then the wisdom brought him back again. So that's why spiritual wisdom is so powerful. Gandhi, he said, when doubts haunt me, when disappointments stare me in the face and I see not one ray of hope on the horizon, then I immediately open the Bhagavad Gita and find a verse to comfort me. And in the midst of overwhelming sorrow, I again find purpose, meaning and inspiration. This is a very famous quote from Gandhi, where he talks about opening the Bhagavad Gita every day and reading a verse just to again reorientate himself. So I think the human journey is a journey in which we will waver, a journey in which we will experience um, different emotions, and, but the wisdom always helps us to come back. I hope that helps. Perfectly imperfect. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, yes. I think they take the mic for the uh, online. So, yeah, that'd be great. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maharaj, for the really inspiring and insightful lecture. It is such an honor to have you at our campus. Um, so, kind of building off of that question, something that you had mentioned about how we go through these like kind of triggering experiences in our life and they trigger us to a higher reality. 
And in those moments, I mean, there are periods of growth, and it can be sometimes tough, and our mind is very chaotic. So how can we kind of frame those experiences um, and like use this sort of like wisdom framework that you were talking about, sort of calm our minds so that we can stay on that path? Yeah, thank you so much. In the intensity of the situation, uh, when emotions are very, very high, how can we uh, ground ourselves to realize the greater purpose behind what's happening? In the ancient traditions, the Bhagavad Gita, and, and actually this is a universal thing amongst the, all religious traditions, we talk about uh, divine wisdom, divine guides, and divinity within. And uh, the strength of one's spiritual connection is proportionate to the strength of one's connection uh, with these three, what we can say, connection points of divinity. The first thing that helps us is connection with divine wisdom. You know, um, in the monastery as monks, we're trained um, that every morning we rise very early and one of the first things we do in the morning is connect with divine wisdom because it's almost as though if you do that first thing in the morning then what happens is your vision is elevated to a vantage point and then when you enter the chaos of life because you've taken the time to elevate your vision Instead of being caught in the chaos of the world, rather you have an elevated vantage point from which to see it um, and to frame it. And so I think the first thing that's really, really important is to develop a very strong connection with divine wisdom. But then sometimes even the mind and the intelligence becomes overcome by our emotions. And therefore, it's said that the second connection point, which is really important, are divine guides, divine friends, uh, others on the spiritual journey who can help you to frame your emotions, who can give you a perspective outside of your own turmoil. Um, one English writer, R.S. Trapp, he says, it's difficult to see the picture when you're inside the frame. And so we need friends who we love, who we trust, who know our heart and who have genuine spiritual accomplishment to give us a perspective that we can't see. And those friends are helping us very much um, to deal with the overwhelming, sometimes overwhelming situations. And then it's said that there's divinity within, that um, the divine person in the Hindu tradition or the tradition of the Gita Krishna also is residing within the heart and uh, in those moments of deep um, yeah, confusion then one learns the art of prayer, one learns the art of how to turn towards divinity within and an accomplished yogi, one who has actually made a connection can actually feel a tangible uh, strength giving inspiration from divinity within. And so uh, these are the things that we uh, take advantage of as we navigate through this world. Um, divine wisdom, divine guides, and divinity within. And there's much more that could be said on that, but just some thoughts. Thank you. Yeah, we'll take just a couple more. I saw a hand up here. First of all, thank you so much, Swamiji. It was very, very enlightening. And my question is about the enlightenment. Uh, as you know, in Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna talks about enlightenment and defines in a lot of details. So what triggered this question is your example about the flight path. And when one achieves the enlightenment, is that always going to follow throughout or you will wear here and there and then you have to come back. Thank you. Thank you so much, yes. Yeah, when one uh, finds a level of enlightenment, a level of self-realization, um, do they ever veer off the path? 
It's interesting if you look in scriptures such as uh, Srimad Bhagavatam, which is like an anthology of, of Puranic stories of some of the most accomplished spiritualists um, in the history of creation. We see that many of them, even after reaching very high levels of spiritual accomplishment, that often they do have moments of weakness or they do have moments where they sometimes deviate from uh, the ideals. Um, but then, of course, through their uh, spiritual connection, they come back very, very quickly. So I think uh, everyone is individual and uh, the journey for everyone is, is an individual journey. Um, but the scriptures do give us this hope that um, sometimes we have this idea that we should live the perfect life. But the scriptures give us this hope through their various accounts that um, we may not be perfect and we may not be able to always be on the perfect path, but we can have the perfect sincerity. And if there's the perfect sincerity, um, then uh, even though one may go through moments of challenge, moments of weakness, moments of being uh, off the path, surely they will come back to the path. And so uh, in this way, I very much appreciated the Sanskrit literatures and the accounts because to me, they very much related to the human condition. It wasn't almost like so utopian and so high and so such a high vision of perfection that you think, oh my God, I'll never get there, you know. But very relatable, very understandable and very hope-giving. So um, I'll just conclude this answer by saying one thing. One of the monks used to say to me, if you're not perfect, you should be humble. <laughs> and then he said, but the moment you're humble, you're perfect. And I like that very much, you know. If you're not perfect, then you should be humble. But the moment you're humble and you rely on divinity, you rely on God, and you put yourself sincerely under that protection, in that moment you become perfect. Because you're no longer relying on your own imperfect abilities, but you've tapped into a higher source of inspiration and strength. There are different... Um, People interface with religion for different purposes. And I don't think we need to sit here and say like one is bad and one is good. But perhaps there is a progression there. And I saw that in my own life. Like I think a lot of religion for many people is social. It's an identity. Um, and they see their religion very much as that, a social identity. I think uh, for some, it goes beyond that and their religion becomes very much like a culture, a ritual, uh, a part of their um, tradition. And they very much interface with the, 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 the rituals and the, the culture of the religion. And that's also very nice. And then I think there are people who really uh, enter into the religion for deeply spiritual reasons, to try to actually understand and connect and experience transcendence and experience God. And uh, the beauty of the Hindu tradition, the beauty of the Vedic tradition is that it almost encompasses what we call multi-level spirituality. So whatever someone wants, even if it's very materialistic, there's a entrance point for them within the tradition. And they enter there and then through their interface with the tradition, they begin to elevate themselves and seek higher things. And so uh, that also very much impressed me about the Vedic uh, kind of uh, schema of spirituality, if you want to use that word, is that it had an entrance point for everyone and there was almost what we call a yoga ladder by which people could actually get to higher and higher levels and more and more profound and spiritual experiences of what was available. So, yeah, thank you so much.